Hi, um, welcome to my presentation. This is a cute week for C++ developers. And I am Roberto Raggi. I work as a principal engineer at Nokia, Qt. And I'm part of the Qt Creator team. You probably already saw Qt Creator quite a bit these days. Yeah, uh, it's not actually a replacement for OpenOffice. Uh, it's an editor, uh, an IDE. And we use it a lot. And I work on the C++ and the QML engine for Qt Creator. So if you thought that QML and uh, C++ work, was working great to QML, uh, to inside Creator, that is also thanks to me and the other Qt Creator guys. Yeah. But I also, in addition, I also contributed to um, QML. I designed and implemented the QML language together with uh, Matthias Atrick and the guys in Brisbane. And this talk is about Qt Quick. Uh, I'm pretty sure that you already know quite a bit about Qt Quick. Uh, it is a set of technologies that we introduced with Qt 4.7. And we hope that you will help developers and, designer to create, and designers to create modern looking user interfaces. Uh, it comes with the new language, a new language, QML, a set of user interface elements, and a number of tools that we created on top of the Qt Creator IDE. Um, the QML language, uh, yes, it is new. Uh, it is actually very simple, but also very powerful. I mean, you saw all the things you can do with it. Uh, it is one of those declarative programming languages. So it is a little bit different than C++, Java, and C Sharp. But you don't have to worry, because uh, the syntax is great. It, it looks great. It's very simple to, to use, to write, to learn. Um, and it builds on top of JavaScript. So if you have a problem, you, know, you can probably ask uh, your web team. <laughs> it's uh, very, very easy to learn. It also builds on Qt Meta Object. Uh, and this is great, because uh, we are C++ Qt developers, and we know the meta object quite a bit. Um, so you have all the good stuff that you have with Qt object. So you have properties, you have signals, slots, invocable methods, all this stuff. Uh, we also introduced a versioned module system. Uh, you saw this, probably. HTML file starts with a bunch of import statements. Um, it has built-in support for animations. And, and I guess you had a pretty good idea now of the things you can do with QML. Um, and this is the cool thing. Uh, it, it integrates very well with existing technologies, like uh, Qt 3D, Qt Mobility, Qt WebKit, and of course, Qt C++. That means that QML is also designed to be embedded into existing applications and also extended with C++. And this is exactly what we are going to show today. And we will do this, uh, this is possible, thanks to the Qt declarative module that you find in Qt 4.7. So uh, what, what we'll find there, uh, the Qt declarative API that we introduced, it's very rich. Uh, I'm going to show you a subset of this API. In particular, I want to show you um, Qt declarative engine, which is uh, like the core of the QML runtime. Uh, I mean, when you instantiate QML elements, QML component, you need to provide a nice environment. And Qt Declarative Engine provides that. You also uh, will have to use uh, Qt Declarative Context. Uh, you have to think uh, that Qt Declarative Context is uh, pretty much like... Uh, oh, sorry, problem. You know, my girlfriend, she asked me to take a cut, an air cut, but I didn't do that. <laughs> and this also, uh, and then, you know, I'm an engineer, but I'm also Italian, so I shake a little bit. And so, yeah, you have to live with that. Uh, so, key declarative context. Um, it's essentially, you have to think about it, like, like scopes in C++. You know, like, well, like when you open a, a, a block scope, uh, you, you open the curly braces and then you close it. What you do there is to... Uh, uh, create a bunch of instances, and then you assign a name to those instances. Well, Qt declarative context is very much, pretty much the same. Uh, you, you know, you just say that this particular instance, this particular value, um, has this name. Then you can use those names in QML programs. 
Um, the third uh, classes, class that we are going to use is queue declarative view. Queue declarative view is nothing more than a, a queue graphics view based class. Uh, so it's just a widget. Uh, you, you can place it and embed it in whatever application you already have. Uh, but it's actually uh, integrated with the rest of QML. So it provides a nice environment to show and visualize the QML QM elements. OK, so this is already a lot of code. I mean, a lot of classes, a lot of stuff to write and a lot of stuff to use. But you don't have to worry too much, because uh, those classes are kind of connected. They use each other. Uh, so for example, the Q declarative view holds an instance of the Q declarative engine, you know, the engine that we use to instantiate the components. And this engine has a reference to the root context. So let's try to use those classes in Creator. So this is Qt Creator 2.1, uh, a beta. And this is our project wizard. You can create different kind of projects. We will go for a just a plain standard Qt GUI application. I just want to show you that there is no magic here. I call this one QML. And uh, I don't think I need to generate a UI file for this. So well. This is uh, the, what we generated. At this point, I want to use the Qt declarative library. And so what, what I will do is um, I will add the Qt declarative module to the profile. See? Um, and then at this point, uh, I can use uh, all the classes from uh, the Qt declarative module inside Qt creator. Um, OK. So what I will do, uh, I will use a widget here. Uh, and I will start to Um, so that is pretty much it. Now I can uh, I have um, a, a Qt declarative view. I can use it. Of course, I want to load some QML file here. And as I said before, I also want to use the engine and the context. And um, we mentioned it. You can get uh, the engine from the view. And you can get the Qt declarative context. from the engine. Uh, what we want to do is to load one QML file uh, and have this QML file uh, embedded in our application. Uh, you do that by using um, the set source method of, um, of the Qt declarative view, and you pass some QML file. There are also alternative ways of doing this, but we, we, we will take it easy. We will go for this, uh, this approach first. Uh, OK, so that would be file name. And now here, I'm going to be evil. Um, yeah, that's very evil. You probably don't do this in your application, right? Um, and then, you know, um, I can just pass a QML file into, into this application. I'll, I'll do this by changing, essentially, the run configuration of Qt Creator. Um, so what I will do is uh, I go to the run settings. I will change the work directory. This is doing shadow build. Uh, so I will point the working directory to the right one, which is our project directory. And I will pass here a main uh, QML file, which we have to create. So now I'm creating this QML file inside Creator. I use the wizard, like I did before. And that is it. Uh, we can probably also, just to be sure that we have something inside, we can add like a text element um, and show hello. And maybe, and maybe we can place uh, the anchor in the object in the middle of the scene. OK, let's try to build and run and cross our fingers. 
end of chords. What? Oh, but this is a typo. This is easy. <laughs> yeah, we know that we don't use that one. Scary. Yeah, there you go. So you have a, uh, um, a QML file embedded in your application. I mean, here you can do whatever you want. You can have all the widgets in, around it, or you know, you can go and do a lot of stuff. And we have an engine and the context, which we can use. For what? OK, so you probably want to expose data. Uh, I think we will take questions at the end, if, it, if you don't mind. OK. Um, I think you probably want to expose data at this point. Uh, as we mentioned before, to expose data, you need to use a queue declarative context. Like in C++, you're going to declare a new variable. Here, you have to do kind of the same. In particular, we're going to use a set context property and set context object. Uh, set context property takes two arguments. One is the name that you want to use in QML, and another one is an existing instance. It can be anything that you can store in a queue variant, or it can be an instance of a queue object based class. Set context object is a little bit magic. It takes a queue object, a queue object based instance and essentially adds all the members of this object to the context. Um, context, actually, they form a hierarchy. You know, each context has a, root, has a parent context. Uh, of course, the root context, which is stored in the engine, is the only one that, that doesn't have any parent. So what does that mean? Is uh, that when you're searching, when you're trying to look up for a name into one particular context, well, you will try to find it. Uh, if it's there, well, you will return the name. Otherwise, you will delegate the search to the parent context, and, and so on. So we know how to expose data. Now, how do we expose and create a new type, a new element? Y you know, the Qt Quick library, it comes loaded with uh, quite a number of elements, like uh, rectangle, mouse area, and so on. But that doesn't mean that uh, uh, it has everything that you need. You may want to expose your own component. And it's actually very easy. The only thing you have to do is to call one function, and it's this magic QML register type. You, know, you need to feed it with uh, a couple of arguments, like uh, the class you want to expose, the name that you want to use in QML, the version, because uh, as I mentioned before, we have a version at module system. But uh, it is actually very easy. Um, and you can see an example there. It's readable. Uh, what we are doing there is to expose the class contact. We're going to call it contact inside the module, module my, and this particular class is at version 1.0. OK, uh, there are a few restrictions, of course. Uh, this type needs to be a queue object based type, uh, but that is OK. You know, if you look at your application, most of the stuff you want to expose, they are probably queue objects. Um, for example, it can be just a queue object. Or uh, it can be if you want to contribute a new model, a new abstract item model uh, that you have. Uh, it can be a class that extends Q abstract item model. Or it can extend Q declarative item, which is uh, one particular uh, Q object based class that we introduced inside the Q, uh, the Q to declarative library. You will find it there, which plays nice with uh, the graphics view, you now with uh, this Q declarative view widget. Then how do you expose properties? I mean, you saw it. You know, a QML file at the end of the story is a bunch of object instantiations, and now we know how to create new elements, and uh, set up those property bindings. So how do you contribute a new property binding? Well, it's like any other queue property. So you just use the queue property macro uh, with the read and the write uh, uh, functions if you have to, to make the property uh, readable. But there is an extra tag that you need to use. Uh, this is, is called a notify tag. Um, and this notify tag takes as a um, parameter uh, a signal. Uh, I, I will show this in a second. Just keep it in mind, which is just the normal queue property you have with this extra notify tag. And this is because uh, properties in QML are a little bit special. They are not like uh, normal properties, because uh, the QML engine is observing them. Uh, every time the property, the value of the property changes, the engine will notify you about this change. And you can hook there and eventually do, I, I don't know, some code. In this particular case, I'm just uh, logging the changes of the width property. So you need some kind of infrastructure. 
Um, but it's actually not that complicated. It, it pretty much looks like uh, the setter and the gather that you have uh, right now today in your apps. The only difference is that at the end, when the value of that property changes, you need to emit this signal. And the name of this signal needs to match the name of the notify tag, the, the, the attribute of the notify tag. Uh, what about the other stuff? Uh, I mentioned it before that we build on top of the QML object. So if you have signals, slots, invocable methods, uh, those things, they just work out of the box. You have to do nothing. Um, and how does it look like? Yeah, for example, if in C++ you have a function uh, called initialize, you tag it with an invocable tag, and then you can use it in QML code like I'm doing in, in the second line. Uh, it's just like any other function. Uh, what about signals? Well, if you have a signal called, for example, triggered, uh, you will get an auto-generated slot uh, with the prefix on and eventually the name triggered. And you can connect to those. Uh, this is really good and magic, and it actually works out of the box. So let's try to contribute a few item, a, a few variables. So we have our main .qml, which actually um, we have also text element in the center of the scene uh, with an art coded text lit uh, string literal. Hello. We, we probably want to change this literal. So uh, let's use message. Of course, now, if I run this application, message does not exist. Um, nothing will happen, and I will get a warning message, a runtime warning message. Uh, this stuff, uh, of course, the errors you get are runtime errors, because uh, well, that's pretty much the nature of QML. Uh, most of the stuff is executed uh, lazily, and so we can't check all the possible mistakes that you are doing. So you need to run your application and eventually check the logs. This is very important. Um, so let's try to contribute message. So we go back to our CPP file, and we use one of the two methods of, uh, the, of the Q declarative context I mentioned before. In particular, we're going to use set context property. We already know the name of the message. The, the variable is message. And now we want to have some message, like uh, ciao. I'm Italian, so I guess I can use chow. So, okay, this is again evil. You probably don't want to use uh, uh, chars here, but then you can use our refactoring engine in Qt Creator and make Q string literal out of it. So, you may want to try Qt Creator 2.1. And now we run, and now we have a chow in the middle of the scene. Okay, now this is a string, right? Um, but that's okay, because uh, we know that we can uh, have any kind of property here. So, for example, let's say that uh, we want to change the background color of our QML application. So, well, we can create a, a, another property of type QColor. Uh, and that's as easy. Of say something like this. So let's try to use it inside QML. We run it. Yeah. Uh, and, and you can go, I mean, you, you got it, right? So if you can store something in the Q variant, then you can use it in QML. You know, we do this marshalling and marshalling for free. It's, uh, it's very powerful. Um, you can do way more than this, of course. What about Q objects? What about uh, uh, communicating between uh, calling function, for example, from, uh, C from C++ or uh, the other way around, calling a C++ function from QML? How can you do this? Um, for example, uh, let's say that uh, we, want, we want to contribute a Q object-based instance. Now, here I could create a new Q object-based instance, or I can just use uh, a Q action, for example. I can set some text. I can make this one. Uh, then I can create also, 
sorry, a slot. And here, for example, I can do whatever I want, of course. This is C++ Qt. For example, we can open a message box. OK, now I need to create this method. And I probably want to connect this slot to the triggered signal. Oh, that's, that's already pretty cool. So we still have to do two things to use this queue action inside QML. Well, we need, of course, to add that in the context, and that we know how to do this. And now here, we want to do something. We want to emit this signal. I mean, we want to emit a signal that we have in the C++ side from QML. Um, so how we do this? We know that we already have the action. So what we can do, for example, is to create a mouse area on top of this text. As you know, the mouse area element is this magic element that we have in QML that enables mouse events, simple mouse events. So what we do is to create a mouse area, and we put it on top of the text. And then when we click on this mouse area, what we want to do is to emit this signal. Um, as you can see, this is quite powerful. Um, of course, you can do more than this. For example, let's say that, sure, you emit the signal. At, at the same time, you may want to change the text of, uh, I don't know, of our label. And maybe you want to use the text that we had in our action. So we do this. Yeah, we did it. And we got some other text. Oh, now, this is just a queue action. But you know, you, you got it. I mean, you can do exactly the same with your queue object based classes. And why is that? Because, uh, well, if you jump to the queue action class, uh, you will see that queue action is uh, QML friendly. Uh, in the properties, it always specified the notify. Uh, the notify attribute. Um, there is a well. We could go here, and I could create an, a key object based class and show you how to do exactly that. But you can. You just have to write the code uh, I had in my previous slide. So I guess you can go back um, to our slides and and show the other things we can do with uh, with the QML and C plus plus. We, 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 I mentioned this one before, queue declarative item. Queue declarative item is um, a queue graphics object. So it's, it's like a visual element. You usually use it if you want to draw something. I mean, before we contributed, um, OK, a, a color and a string, or uh, a queue object, which is not visual. But sometimes you want to draw something. Uh, you know, maybe you already have uh, images or pixmaps you want to use, or maybe you already have a, a, a class, a queue graphics view class, based class, that you may want to reuse inside the QML. Uh, and for that, you have to uh, extend the queue declarative item. Uh, this also provides you uh, the properties that are in common with all our visual uh, items, like uh, the x and y position, width and height, and the anchors. Uh, you saw the anchors also before. Uh, it's the way we do layout in QML. So if you have a queue declarative item, you can use the anchors and all the good stuff that you, that, that you see in, uh, with, uh, with all the other visual items. But if you want to draw something, uh, then you have to remember to do two things. 
Of course, you need to re-implement the paint event because you want to draw something. And you need to clear the flag, item has no content. This is important because uh, for uh, um, QML is very optimized. Uh, you know, we have a great team in Brisbane, in Australia, working on that, and they optimized everything. And as default, uh, they saw that uh, it is good to just not draw. So if you have to draw something, and you really have to, then you set this, you clear this flag. I'm going to show you an example of this later. Um, there is more. I mean, so we know how to contribute plain Q object based classes. We know if we have to draw something, we want to extend Q declarative item. What about model view? I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, you guys have huge models uh, with a lot of stuff loaded there. Um, and you probably want to use those models inside QML, because uh, the, the user interface probably is actually easier to implement in QML, but you probably don't want to do the logic of your, uh, of your app in QML, especially for a big application with a lot of data. Well, the good news is that uh, all we, we, in QML we have a model view framework, but this model view framework is based on, Q, on the Qt model view framework. So if you have a QAbstract uh, atom model class, you can just contribute this class uh, to, to, to QML, to the engine, and then you can just use it. Uh, there is no magic there. And we have a few classes already, that, that a few views that you can use with those models. For example, we have the list view, uh, we have the repeater, we have the grid view, the path view, we have a lot of stuff there. And there is, of course, um, uh, a very powerful feature of uh, our model view framework, which are you know, these uh, rows. That means that uh, you can create a new atom, and you, specif you can specify values for those atoms uh, using you know, this, uh, this mechanism called the rows. I'm pretty sure that you use this a lot. Uh, well, unfortunately, these rows are just the numbers. You, know, you usually write uh, my custom role, which is uh, a cute user role plus some constant. It's a number. And you can't use those numbers in QML. So you have to tell QML, you know, this, uh, this role, when you use this role in QML, well, you have to use this name instead. And if you have to do this, well, there is one function that you want to call, and it's called set role names. This one takes a dictionary, a map, from uh, user roles to the string that you want to use in QML. Uh, in the 90% of the case, probably you don't have to do this if you are okay by just uh, using uh, the standard uh, QML, sorry, acute roles like display or edit. So let's give it a try. Um, now, of course, I can try to create uh, a new abstract, abstract model, which you know is very, very easy to do in C++. But thanks God, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to create a my model, which extends the QString list model. I think this is good enough. I think this builds. OK. Um, OK, as you know, the string list model, you know, it extends. There is no magic here. It, it extends um, Q abstract list model and eventually Q abstract atom model. So OK, it works with, with Q string list model, but that doesn't matter. In, you know, it will work also with your own uh, models. So I'm going to create a bunch of strings here. Uh, for example, uh, I don't know. Uh, let's create a few of those. I don't know. I think let's try this. And then... Um, oh gosh, this is evil. And we need to... So we created um, a bunch of strings. Doesn't matter. It can be any data. Uh, in this particular case, we're using a string list model, and we show strings. Um, we do exactly. Whoa! <laughs> it wasn't me. I hope uh, it was exactly. I mean, we actually have to do exactly what we did before. Uh, not not a big deal. So we know how to do this. Uh, we need to expose an instance. Uh, so we go to our context, and we just say context, uh, set context property. Uh, we call this one my model, 
And then here we pass this, this model we created. Uh, I think we need to include it. Uh, C++. Good. So now we have the model. Uh, now we need to use this model in, uh, in, uh, in QML. So how you do this? Um, of course, we need to jump to a QML file. Um, OK, let's say that we are not that interested in this text anymore, so we turn it off. What we do instead is to use one of these model view classes. So for example, we could use uh, the list view. Um, so what would be the model of this list, list, this list view? Well, it's exactly the instance we created, my model. So and what I want to do here, well, here you can do whatever you want, essentially. You know, you can provide the, the delegate. I think the delegate framework, the way we do uh, model view in QML, it's very easy and powerful. I'm not really into model view, but I can use QML for that, uh, which I think is great. Um, so for example, what we can do is, uh, Every time that we need to do something, uh, we want to uh, sorry we want to show an item of this model. What we'll do is to create a text element, and what we want to show is uh, the display role of that element. So that is, you know, if we have like a bunch of items there, uh, we also have to place this um, this list view, and but that we know that we can use anchors. So what I'm doing here is, uh, OK, every time you need to draw, you need to display an atom, what you have to do is to create a text element for that particular atom and, uh, well, show it, you know, and you can show it by using the display role. Yeah, that's it. I mean, this is actually a million atoms, right? It's not, not, not that bad. Um, and this is not that bad because uh, this stuff is very smart. I mean, uh, the, the, the guys that, uh, you know, in, in Brisbane, they worked on the model view framework here, they really did an, an awesome job. So it is true that you have a million items in your model, but we are actually not displaying a million objects here. So we don't need to have a million text around for the whole lifetime of our application. But all this stuff, you don't have to care about. All this stuff is done in the engine. So the only th things that you have to care about is, I want to show this item, I want to use these QML uh, elements to do this, and you can be you can use any kind of element there. Uh, we have uh, awesome examples showing this. And then the QML engine takes care of everything. You know, it will try to create this atom lazily. It will dispose those atoms when he thinks that it's not they are not necessary anymore, and so on. It's very powerful. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that you can do the same with Qt C++. But you know you need a lot of experience there. I mean, you you need to know how to use those classes. With QML, you don't have to. I mean, this is not brainwashing. It's it's true. You should really give it a try. Oh, you guys don't like blue. Hmm. So which color? I guess I can just. Use white. You know? Yeah, I'm bad with colors. So we go back to our slides. I mean, we learned a lot. Uh, I mean, we know how to contribute objects. We know how to contribute model view. Uh, we know that we can eventually contribute also graphics objects, visual items. Um, and we also saw, actually, and, and until no, till now, what we did is to take a Qt declarative view and embed this Qt declarative view inside an existing application. So we learned how to embed QML. Now, what about extending QML? You know, let's say that you don't want to provide your own main application. You just want to use a, a standard QML viewer, or you want to create a library that you want to deploy, maybe, and maybe share this library with other projects. How you do this? Well, for that, there is uh, something called an extension uh, plugin. Uh, this is actually, you know, it builds on top of our plugin system in, in Qt. So I'm pretty sure that you already know how to use plugins in Qt, and here there is not much difference. At the end of the story, you need to bundle your types and your extensions in a plugin. Uh, in order to do that, of course, you need to, to extend 
uh, one particular uh, base class, um, and in this case, it's queue declarative uh, extension plugin. And you need to do two things, of course. I mean, we saw this before, right? What you do with QML is to expose data and register types. So we have two functions here. Register types, where you will call all these QML register types we saw before. And then you have um, initialize engine. In initialize engine, you will get the queue declarative engine instance. And we know that from the queue declarative engine instance, we can get the context, and we can contribute existing instances there. That means if you want to create an extension, a plugin, and this plugin will have only types, you just have to implement one function, register types. If you want to create a plugin which will have types, but also other things like functions, global functions or global members, you need to implement also initialize engine. Well, this is not enough. You need also to provide another file called QMLDIR. QMLDIR is like a manifest file. It essentially tells the engine, it teaches the engine about the plugin that you want to load when you load this module, and, and eventually what are the versions of the elements you have in this module. Uh, but you don't have to worry, because the QMLDIR file is extremely easy to write. It's a line-based text file, and we have tons of examples and pretty good documentation about it. Then you bundle all this stuff in the plugin, a library, which you already know how to do this, and then you export the plugin using you know, the Q export plugin to macro. Yeah, I guess we can do this in Creator. Uh, it's not that big deal. So what we do, uh, let, let's start from scratch. Um, we close all the projects. We use um, two different wizards. So, so, so we have a better overview of, uh, uh, of how to do things. So we go to the Qt Quick project, and what we will do is to create a simple Qt Quick UI project. We call this one uh, QML2. OK, so this, this Qt, Qt Quick UI project, uh, they, are not, they do not generate executable. Right? They will just use the QML viewer application that we have in Qt to run this QML file. I mean, it doesn't even have a profile, uh, but these things will run just fine in the viewer. So what we want to do um, is to create a plugin and uh, tell the viewer to use this plugin. Uh, and for that, we have another wizard you can use. Uh, it's um, in the same category, and it's called a custom QML extension plugin. Um, and here you create your plugin. Uh, I guess we can call it um, my. Now you have to place it. I want to keep these things uh, simple. So what I will do is to place it inside the directory of, uh, the, the, the exit, um, of the project we created before. So we will create the stub for my application inside that directory. Here we'll contribute one atom. Uh, you can specify a name if you want to. I, I will keep the default. I think I'm OK with it. And this generates a bunch of files. Now, as you can see in Kit Creator, now I have two projects loaded. One is uh, this My project, which is contributing one plugin, and it's a profile. The other one is just uh, a QML project, which has nothing to do with, um, with uh, Qt, like uh, you know, it doesn't have a profile. Um, so what I can do here is, uh, for example, um, I don't know if you know about this, but when you have multiple multi projects in Creator, you can uh, configure and switch the active project. And I'm doing. I'm going to do this. Uh, I mean, right now I know that uh, the active project was QML2. I mean, the, the project we created before. But I want to change a few settings of the plugin, so I will switch to my. And then I go to the project view where I can customize this thing. Uh, since I want to keep this thing simple, uh, what I will do is to turn off. Shadow build, so then I don't have to care about uh, tell the you know the library sorry tell the plugin you know look inside this directory. For real application, you want to keep the shadow build on because uh, they are very helpful. But I'm trying to keep this one simple, so I turn it off. Uh, then, then at this point, what I can do is just to go back to my original QML project. Um, I build this plugin. Now, there's two things I want to show you. Um, this my atom that, that is generated is essentially a queue declarative atom. So this is good. 
I mean, that means that we can use uh, this, uh, this code and create eventually a visual plugin. I mean, we can draw something on screen. Um, and then I want also to show you uh, the other file we generated, which is this My Plugin, which, uh, as I, I told you before, it extends Qt Creative Extension Plugin. In this particular case, I mean, this plugin is, uh, is only, the only thing that it's doing is to register one type, which we know how to do this. Um, so it's actually implementing only one virtual function, register types. And inside this register types, what it is doing, it's exactly what I showed you before. It is calling QML register type of the type that we want to register. We give it the QML name, the initial version number, and eventually the module. Now, uh, there is still something that we have to do. I mean, uh, this, if I run, right, it, um, sorry, if I go, need to go to project, I still need to tell uh, Git Creator which file, which QML file he has to, to, to show. If I run, I'm still, I'm not using this module, uh, but it should be there. I should be able to use it. So, well, let's try. So I go to QML. So we know that what we did it is to create a plugin called my, right? So, and, and we know that the version is 1.0. So I should be able to write import my 1.0. But I get an error. Um, and this is actually not because Qt Creator is broken, because actually if, we, if you try to run it, you will get exactly the same error you know, when trying to run this application. Uh, and this is because you need to tell uh, the QML viewer to search for plugin in one particular place, in one directory. So I was trying to keep these things simple, so I'm lucky, because what I have to do, I have just to open the QML project file. I can hide this. And as you can see, there is one line at the bottom which tells you, you know, which, you know, which you can use, actually, to teach the engine of the paths, the import paths you want to use. So what I'm going to do here is to tell the engine to look for plugin in the current directory. Now I saved. Um, I'm going back to the QML file, and that, that, uh, that warning message, that error message disappeared. Now it's good. I mean, that means QML knows about this plugin. So now, what about code completion? I mean, can I use this atom inside Qt Creator like any other atom? Yes, you can. I look like Obama. And you just do my atom. And now it's, it's there. You know, this is the, my atom that we created in C++. It is here. Um, OK, you know, we can run it. Of course, nothing happens here because we're not drawing stuff. Um, let's assign some width and some height to this atom. Um, oh, still, there is still nothing there. So we go back. Yeah, we go back to our C++ file, which is actually defining this atom. I mean, here there is a nice comment which tells you exactly what you have to do. So if you want to draw something, you probably want to remove this comment. And that's what we do. Um, then the second step is that we want to draw, right? So, so what we do is we re-implement the method my atom paint. Oops. Um, I think we need to use the painter. So what we do is to include Q painter. And now I'm going to use my awesome graphics uh, skills and draw scary, probably work. Let's be crazy, I don't know. Scary. Of course. Oh, uh, of course, because I forgot to declare this method, but then I can use Qt Creator. Yeah, add the public decoration. It's here. Oh, wow. Got the circle. Now, actually, the, the, question, the point here is that you have a cube painter there. You can do whatever you want. You can reuse uh, your existing code. You can do whatever you want there. Now, yeah, I'm pretty bad, so I draw a circle. Uh, circle. But you, you, know, you, you got the idea. So you can contribute pretty much everything you have today. It's inside this scene. It's inside the graphics view. 
so for example, you can also use uh, uh, widgets on Canvas, right? We have these uh, Qgraphics graphics view widgets that you can embed. And you know, it's pretty much the same. Or if you just want to use our QStyle API there, you can do it. Uh, we also have a couple of projects trying to do smart things there. Um, let's go back to our slides. OK, so this was actually, I think it was very advanced already. But you saw, I mean, we use three classes and two functions. That tells you a lot. That tells you that the design of this library and design of the QML it's sound is done in the right way. You don't need to use like a few thousand methods to do good stuff or to, to impress your, uh, your uh, colleagues. You can do a lot of things with very little. Uh, but there is a lot more in QML. It's, it's amazing. I mean, for example, um, you can also use Q declarative, Q declarative engine and um, Q declarative context without a Q declarative view. That means that if you don't want to use a graphics view, but you just want to use plain widgets, plain Q widget, well, you can do that. Of course, in that case, you, you don't care about the Q graphics view canvas, so you won't use the Q declarative view, but you can animate widgets because they are just Q objects. There are a few differences. I mean, to, to, to a few things that you need to change when working with widgets inside the QML. OK, the first one is that, uh, of course, you probably don't want to have them inside the Q declarative view. The second thing is that uh, we saw that before. In order to bind to properties, those properties, they need to have the notify attribute. Now, a few items, like a Q action, you know, has those tag, but not all the Qt. So for example, uh, I don't know, if you are using a Q push button, you know, it, the X, Y property, or all the other properties, they don't have this attribute notify. That means that you probably have to wrapper those widgets into something else. Uh, the other limitation that you will have, if you want to use plain old widgets, old, no, still new, um, in, in QML, uh, what you have to do, uh, well, actually what you can't do is to use anchors. I mean, I, I told you before, uh, uh, in order to use anchors, you need to use Q declarative item. And that one is a Q graphics object. Um, but that's okay. You know, you will do layout in a different way. Uh, there is more than this. Actually, I can probably show you this uh, before I can. Um, let's open another creator. So this little application with this very bad name, the moving button, uh, I think I was probably watching some science fiction movie with a monster with tentacles when I, when I wrote it. Um, it's actually using plain old widgets. So what I'm doing here is, uh, yeah, I actually haven't configured this one. It's not a plugin, so Creator is still under lines. But we know that if you, if you write plugins, Creator will know about your types. So that is what you should do. Here I was lazy. But what I'm doing here is to use just plain old widgets and uh, apply states, transitions, and all the stuff that you have in QML. I'm not going to show this. Uh, I'm just going to run it. Uh, actually, maybe I can show you that the C++ file is, is actually doing exactly, is using exactly the same techniques I showed you before. Uh, so for example, at the end of the story, what we do is to instantiate an engine directly. We don't go to the graphics view. We just create it. We take the root context from the engine. We know that we can do that. And then, instead of using a Q declarative view set source, I'm using this other class that you will find in, um, in uh, the Qt declarative library, which is called the Qt declarative component. So this one, you can use it to instantiate QML files. That is pretty much the only difference. Um, now, if I run this one, this is a push button, right? A normal Q push button, no graphics view stuff here. And if I click it, this one animates with QML and with two different easy curve. Uh, I mean, this is probably not that impressive, but I think it shows you things you can do, the things you can do today. Um, I also have another one uh, using the same technique, showing that it's not only about push buttons. We have to use 2.1. Yeah, this one uh, it's just called editor. And what I'm doing here is to have just uh, an editor. 
which so then it's just cute. Again, uh, no QML items. And when I press Control F, I get like a, a Chrome-like search box uh, on the top left. And then I can search for uh, you. And it's there. can do it again, probably. Um, and as you can see, I will show you, uh, this is actually the same. I can go you and show you the, the CPP file, exactly the same as what I did before. I create the engine, I take the root context, I register my existing items. In this particular case, what I'm doing is to register a main window, right? And how the QML file, yeah, same problem I had before. I was lazy here. But here you can see, right, the search box. I'm calling methods which you probably already know like select all, show, raise, set focus. And this is because those are exposed in the meta object. I can just use them. Um, and then, then I said, look, I can also create behaviors on the search box Y property, which is a property I added. Um, and then I get, uh, you know, this. I think it's pretty good stuff. Um, again, there is way more than this. Uh, for example, if you have uh, a lot of images you want to contribute uh, or you want to load these images in different threads and do magic stuff there, there is another class that you want to re-implement and it's called Q Declarative Image Provider. Uh, we have examples for this. We actually, we have a lot of examples. So if you go and download Qt 4.7, uh, you go inside uh, the demos and the examples directory, there is another subdirectory called Declarative, which is loaded with an incredible amount of examples. And we also have pretty good documentation and tutorials. Um, so go there, and there is a lot of stuff. Uh, we also show image provider there. And there is more. I mean, in QML, in these days, actually, we just showed you a subset of the language and a subset of the library. But it is very rich. There is a lot of things you can do. And we also introduced a few nice concepts there. Uh, for example, one is attached properties. Um, you know, we use these attached properties a lot in our components. Um, you may probably, you know, uh, go pretty far without using them, but they are very convenient. So for real application, you may want to use and look at also these other advanced features that we have in QML. We have also, and it's brand new stuff, but we already have a pretty good community, mostly because this is open source code. It builds on top of Qt. It is part of Qt 4.7. And so you can use the standard Qt channel, you know, to provide feedback to us. And we also have a few more extra channels, like uh, the Qt QML mailing list. So if you have any issue, you just go there and you ask the guys. Uh, we have the Qt QML uh, IRC channel, uh, where you know, the Qt QML developers hang out. And you can go there and ask for information. And you know, it's very friendly, very open. So you probably already know. Just go there and ask for questions. Uh, we have the labs, which is full of uh, blog posts about QML. It's a very hot topic, and a lot of engineers in Nokia, they really like to use QML also for uh, their own uh, pet projects. So they like to blog about it. So just go there and check the blogs. There is a lot of stuff to, to there. And then again, this is open source, and it's part of Qt. So you go to Guitarius, you download Qt, and QML is there. And we are also starting a new project, project called Qt Components. This is very, very interesting. Um, I mean, you saw that before, right? Uh, you can um, contribute your Q widget inside QML with a few limitations. You could do that. Or you can embed the widgets inside the graphics view and use that in QML. But that's not what we want to do, I think. I think we are ex essentially experimenting different ways, and we think that maybe a widget set for QML should be implemented in QML. So what we are doing is to create widgets, like uh, you know, powerful text editor, push buttons, sliders, all this stuff, and uh, bundle this stuff in a library. Uh, for now, we call these things Qt components. Uh, we have a great team working on this, and it's also open source. It's there, you know, and we update it every single day. So you may want to try it. And well, that's all for me. Thank you, guys, for uh, for watching. Yeah, I think we have time for questions. Uh, yeah. uh, is there a concept of scroll bars with uh, QML? Actually, you can write the scroll bar in QML with, uh, I think, 15 or 10, I don't remember if it's 10 or 15, lines of code. So, and we have tons of examples showing that. I don't know if you were in my 
um, in my presentation yesterday, but in an hour, I managed to create a slider, push button, and a few other components easily. So again, with the QML and the Qt Quick library, you don't have the slider. In Qt component, we are going to provide, sorry, uh, the, the, um, the scroll bar. With Qt component, we are going to provide also the scroll bar. But all our examples, they pretty much have their own scroll bar there. And if you look at our example, you will see that you need 10 lines of code to, to write your own, which looks and feels like you want to. Um, you showed us with the um, model view that the speed um, was optimized in QML. Um, does this mean that there could be cases where the um, context view or well, the QML um, would be faster than using a graphics view? OK, so if you ask me, I think that uh, this is what we will see, maybe. I mean, at least this is what I hope. And uh, this is because uh, graphics view, in a way, it's low level. I mean, QML builds on top of graphics view. So in a way, it is weird to say, you know, QML can be faster. But if you think about it, when you write graphics view based application, what you will do is to use pretty much uh, all the functions that there are there. And if you are a good developer, you can probably get uh, the most out of it. With QML, you have a, a very high level function uh, set. Everything is, uh, you know, is done behind the scene. And that is a huge opportunity for us, because what we can do there is to rearrange things and make them faster. So it's like a compiler, which they can optimize your code, your high-level code, because uh, you are using only high-level function. And since you are using a lot of high-level function, what we do inside the QML engine is try to rearrange them and try to be as fast as possible. So even if you don't write extremely good code, because you are lazy and this is just a prototype, QML will perform reasonably well. I'm pretty sure that you can get the same performance with the graphics view, but then there you have to be sure and have to care, take care about the optimization yourself. It's like uh, writing assembler versus C++, I think. I mean, this is my personal opinion. Thank you. So the answer to my question will probably be look in the demonstration and files. Um, but I gotta ask, could you, in these famous f ten or five lines of code, make a new delegate for the list view you showed us before? Uh, I think I did uh, in the example, didn't I? No, a new one, a uh, different one. Make your own delegate. Oh. So you want that one was my own delegate. I can make another one. No okay, you, okay. Thank you. Um, so let's start Qt Creator again. I think our example was called QML. So you want to be evil, huh? <laughs> so this is our delegate. Yeah, not fancy. So let's make it a little bit more interesting. Uh, OK, since I got pretty good with QML recently, so what I will do is to create um, a, a row where I have uh, this text, and then I want to create, I don't know, let's say a rectangle. Uh, let's give it some, um, let's give this text an ID, so then I can use it. So I call this one um, D, I'm very lazy. And here I'm going to say that, uh, you know, the width of this text is exactly, uh, actually the height of this text is exactly the height of, uh, of this rectangle, sorry, the height of the text. And I say that the width is the height. That's good. I, of course, to, in order to show something here, I probably have to assign a color. So we probably want to have different colors. So I'm going to generate a random color. And I do that by saying Qt RGBA. I can use the full power of JavaScript, which is the beauty of QML. It builds on top of JavaScript, so you can use the library. So I generate a, a random color. And I think if I run this, whoa, yeah. And this is a random color. I mean, I think, you know, you got the idea. This stuff is really good. <laughs> okay. Um, we've seen how to load QML files uh, from a URL. 
Is it also possible to load uh, QML files from within your project, like uh, with the resource system? Actually, yes. Uh, it is possible. I think we also have an example. I think we ported the same game to do this, but I'm not sure. But this is something that we did, so it should work. Hi. Uh, can I get control to list you in my C++ cloud here in this example? Well, it's a, it's a Q decorative view, right? It's right. a Q widget, so why not? Okay. <laughs> you just have to embed the Q widget. But there is a, there is a price there that you will pay. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I mentioned this before, uh, is that uh, each Q declarative view has its own Q declarative engine. Now, you have to think about this Q declarative engine like something um, like a JavaScript engine, right? So, like a virtual machine. So, then if you have in your application like uh, 10 Q declarative view, they will not share the engine. They will have 10 of those engine, which is not that bad. But of course, there is a price that you have to pay and you need to evaluate it. Uh, one more question I have. Like, uh, if I want to develop a composite widget uh, which uses already inbuilt Qt widgets as well as my own widget, can I do that in QML right now? I mean, uh, maybe. Could be. I'm not really into graphics, but my answer is that uh, I don't know. It looks like you can do everything with QML. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm okay, pretty sure that you. you could. Hi. I have a basic question. How do we package a QML application? Oh. The Actually, we have a solution for that. And uh, the solution is very easy. You just have to download Qt Creator 2.1. And uh, what, what will happen is that here we have um, in the projects in Qt Quick, uh, which are, we also, also have a pretty good des description, um, like this one, Qt Quick application. Uh, this one it creates a Qt Quick application. And it's actually it's one application that you can deploy. So, and this one uh, um, uh, actually can be used in two different ways. If you already have QML files, you can import your QML files and into, you know, into this particular um, uh, quick application. Or it, you can start from scratch here. Um, but then again, you need Qt 4.7 on your device. I think that we have Qt 4.7 on Mego devices. Uh, I don't know if you have them, that on Symbian yet. But just a load Qt creator, and you would be able at least to deploy on the simulator. Hi. Uh, I'm wondering how lightweight this QML is. Um, suppose we are going to use it to model special button behavior. Are we going to be able to deploy it 20 times in an application? OK. A uh, thousand I, times? Yeah. <laughs> You know, I think it is. Um, again, this is new stuff, right? So we are trying, uh, trying it. You know, we are seeing, we are trying to see what we can do with it. But and we also, you know, doing a lot of uh, performance experiments. And right now, looks like uh, it's pretty good. It scales very well. There is still a lot of optimization to do. And we have, uh, for example, a team in uh, Oslo working on uh, the new scene graph, which will optimize even more QML. And we also have people working uh, in um, uh, the JavaScript core community trying to optimize uh, the just-in-time compiler and the JavaScript for our use case. Because this stuff, also, it's pretty fast because it's uh, just-in-time compiled. But there are a few optimizations that we can do because uh, maybe we know how the stuff is used. So we have a team of people working on that. So right now, it looks like it's pretty good and it scales. There might be cases where it doesn't scale that well. But again, we really believe that this is the way to go, and we have people uh, trying to <laughs> get the most out of it. So try it. How can the QML be unit tested? Uh, actually, we have a lot of tests for QML. Um, and we also have um, one uh, small class called the visual test. And actually, there is a one directory in Qt which I think is 4.7 tests. Auto, declarative. And here you can see that there is quite a number of tests. Um, I don't know, more than 2,000 tests, 3,000. And they test in QML in a lot of different ways. So you can look at those and, and, uh, and see how you can test your apps. I mean, you know, we have a, a test framework in Qt. It's part of Qt. So just look at the way we do it. Sorry. 
Hello. Hey. Uh, what happens when you expose this, this model, for example, to your QML and afterward it's changing? Do I have to expose it again or is it a reference? No, that's the cool thing about um, our model view framework. You know, the model view framework uh, already handles all the changes, right? You have this uh, data changes. This is also the reason why it is a little bit complicated. Uh, because it's exactly the standard for this use case, incremental updates. And the list view and all the atoms in, uh, in QML, they take care of this. So they are doing the right thing. So if you update the model in, uh, in the C++ side, and if, you, if your model is doing the right thing, so you know, communicating the data changed, then QML will just update the view and recreate eventually the delegate if, if it has to. Hi. Uh, if you're using Q widgets, how are they? Uh, how are they embedded in the declarative view? If I mean, I showed that before. Though those widgets, they were not embedded in the Q declarative view. Declarative view. They were you know, just normal widgets. But we have examples showing how you can uh, uh, embed widgets inside uh, the graphics view. No, like 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 when you embed Q graphics view widgets. No, I think in in which technical way are they embedded in the view? Is this uh, we are. Q graphics proxy widget, and then how is the performance when using if, complex UIs? If you if you are uh, if you are embedding widgets inside the graphics view, then yes, because this is a, uh, inside the declarative view. Then yes, because this is uh, a Q declarative. Sorry, Q declarative view is a Q graphics view. So we're using the same technology there. Okay. I mean, it's not that uh, QML and Q declarative view is better than a Q graphics view for because it builds on top of it. It's just that it builds on top of it, and um, we have a lot of room for uh, optimizing, you know, code. So even if you write, uh, you know, prototypes, they will still run at decent speed because we can optimize that. But it's graphics view. Okay, thanks. Do I win the prize at the end? <laughs> Uh, if you have multiple declarative views open, is it possible to run each of them in a separate thread? Um, I mean, the point is that uh, you can't have widgets in a separate thread, right? You can just have objects in a separate thread. All the widgets, at least right now, they run in the GUI thread. But I think, personally, is that this is something that will be fixed. I mean, you know that we have tons of projects going on in Qt. One project is a Project Lighthouse. Project Lighthouse uh, I think it can be used for so many things. And I think that in the future, maybe, but this is, I know, maybe they disagree with me. I, I have no idea. I'm not really into that, that stuff. I'm more like a, a parser guy, not, uh, not a graphics guy. But I really think that uh, eventually, in future, maybe it will be possible. But for now, only objects, they can live in a different thread, not, not views. I mean, that would be very interesting for, for animated um, widgets. Just yep. to share the performance of the of the multi-core architectures you typically have nowadays. Mm. But uh, you know you can probably do something about it. You know, like for example, if you move all the computation into different threads, you can probably do something about it, and have only the drawing. I mean, it also depends on different factor, I guess. But that is not something that I can answer. But we have a lot of graphics guru and people also involved in Lighthouse. So we may want to ask them. Hi. Um, how can you get uh, the signals in C++? So if a uh, QML object emits a signal, how do you get that in C++? Well, you could work around it, right? I mean, for example, uh, um, I mean, as you showed it before, what I did is to invoke a C++ signal from QML. And with a little bit of um, magic, what you could do is to uh, call some function in C++ that will do the magic for you. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't tell you right now because uh, I don't know. But it is definitely possible. But you know, the point is that you have a two-way communication there. I mean, I saw, uh, you show it. I saw I show it before. So with just a little bit of code, since you have two-way communication, you could do that. Now, I, I, not right now, I don't know. <laughs> but you have two-way communication, so you just have to work around a little bit, and you will find your way doing this. Maybe we already have an example. Actually, I probably should mention this, that one, uh, um, one great example, actually one great source of examples for, uh, for C++ um, and Q declarative together, it's, um, sorry, it's, um, 
it's this directory. Um, examples, declarative, CPP extensions, reference examples. Um, you find here a bunch of uh, small examples, very, very small examples. They're not even using a GUI, very small. Um, one that shows you how to add properties, another one that shows you how, how to create attached properties, which I didn't have time, but it's very helpful stuff. Uh, how to create binding, how to uh, convert things from uh, a type to the base type, uh, um, create group properties, uh, how to do things with signal, and uh, value source, which are the things that we use for behavior. So they are very simple, you know, like a uh, small example, I, I, I don't know, for example, let's go to adding and you will see there isn't much code here in this example, like 200 lines of code. But they are great because uh, you go there, they explain one feature and only one, and then you get an idea of what you can do with QML. And maybe one of those examples, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's providing what you want. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Yeah. Thank you, guys. As, as usual, um, we would like to ask...